on the other side of the river. I guess I can show that picture of the ranch. Uh, the, that's the Missouri River. This is a cut bank ridge, about two or three hundred foot high. Some of the poorest land there is off the cut banks, the clay pan, pure, from pure sand to uh, uh, Belmo to uh, Bentonite from, from the cut banks. So there's some very tough, uh, tough soils to work with. But again, uh, my, I'm going to talk about soil health and how you can build, uh, build, a, build your system to get resilience. Again, we've destroyed, destroyed the land over 50, 60 years of farming. And uh, so now we've got to build it back. And so uh, today I'm going to show some of the things that I did with the, uh, I'm supposed to talk on the irrigated ground, on what, uh, how I use cover crops and stuff to heal that. But first of all, I just wanted to show, show our operation. Um, we're with very intensive grazing. We custom graze uh, for the neighbor, and plus then we run a, a, about 150 cow, cow calf pairs of our own. And then you custom graze anywhere from 100 to 120 head. And uh, again, uh, we've got to kind of just explain our grazing system. We've got a uh, deep pipeline to two cell centers. And this here one, this unit runs with uh, a live stream running through it, so it takes a little different management. And plus, we also lease some core land, so that's always a challenge. Uh, this year, the lake came up. And uh, about 1st of July, so then everything got to move out. So then I'll run one herd down there, one herd on the pivot, and the custom grades go on these others. So this year we got to run the, run the herd from the river bottoms with the ones on the pivot. And plus then we seeded all our other cropland, or the majority of it back to grass. Again, a very diverse mixture of grasses and legumes, but first we healed it by planting uh, warm season covers for four to five years straight and then plant it back to the first finish of grass that we use. So I'll, uh, I guess I'll get started here. Again, uh, the, the five principles of soil health, uh, you've got to keep that ground covered. Again, I, I, I feel the, we've got to take care of the land and uh, we've got to take care of the life, the soil is alive. So, so to, uh, to, uh, to make the soil critters below ground, the herd below the ground, and mutton that we're managing. And if we can uh, manage that with these five soil health principles, um, you're going to be very profitable. Again, soil armor, you've got to keep that ground covered. That's so important, whether it's cropland or rangeland. And again, the second one, minimize soil disturbance. Uh, again, we've got to quit tilling the soil. We've got to quit using all these chemicals and uh, fungicides, insecticides. It's all disturbing the soil life. <laughs> and again, plant diversity. We're, we're uh, pretty much a monoculture in our cropping system. It's small grains or probably two crop types. So we've got to change that and get as many crop types as possible. And that's where your cover crops really come in and add that diversity. And again, the covers, you can have a living root growing as long as possible. Where in the past, we've got grain crops, wheat, for example, that grows till planted in 1st of May, and by late July, it's actually ripe, so it's actually not a, not a living root anymore, so we've got to extend the growing season. And then we've got to get more livestock back on the land, and that's so important. Again, this, uh, this is a pivot, it's 128 acres. So that's what I'll talk about today. And then there's also a pivot on this side. There'll be slides in there where we grow a cover crop. This is our hay production. And we, uh, when, uh, for example, when we take this out, well, I guess I'll go with this other first. When we, these are seven acre paddocks on a pivot and very high stock density. And we'll also split those, those uh, with a poly wire. And that's the rig I use. You got your reel on there. And you're stepping the post, so you, can, you don't have to get off the four wheeler. You just hook up your wire, drive along, every so often throw a stick your foot out, stick the post in. So, in 10 15 minutes, you can take the fence down and put one up. So, you can make it very simple. Again, we use uh, fiberglass tanks. And again, it's very convenient for the small calves. We can calve in late May and June. Uh, again, that was probably the biggest thing we've done. But the cattle operation has changed that category. 
that makes uh, life very simple and a lot, lot more enjoyable. So, me and my wife Bonnie and I, we both actually worked off the farm. I worked for the Soil Conservation District of Burley County and uh, for about ten and a half years, so we had to make the ranch run on its own. So you, you sure as heck couldn't go have another full-time job in your cabin in February and March. So you can have in May and June out in the pasture. You don't have to look at the cattle. We were checking some of every third day, some once a week, and uh, cows are a lot better without you around. <laughs> so our, again, our cattle percentage is actually going up. Normally what we do, uh, we turn bulls out you know, about mid-August. At that time, any cow that doesn't have a calf on her side goes to market. This year on the herd at the river bottom, there was 95 head there. And uh, out of the 95, there was eight that didn't have calves that side. So we either lost their calves or they were, were open. So so that, in the past, generally we'd have about a 10% open in the fall. In the, and again, we had really, we still lost calves. So, so again, that's probably the best thing we did was to the cavalry. Then again, just showing the center, uh, we just used it by the tank. We used, uh, we used one exit this ribbon. Uh, at first, I put two of them on, and kept one, one worked just fine. Cal gets so used to that uh, electric fence and the poly wire or this poly tape, uh, so it makes it uh, very easy to move cattle. Just another shot of them out on the pivot. Again, uh, very high stock densities. And just kind of a before and after. On the left is where we had grazed, and on the right is what's, what hasn't been grazed yet. So we'll, uh, we'll graze that. Uh, sometimes we graze it three times over the season. This year we got just a little over 100 grazing days per acre. When I first seeded this pivot into, into grass, uh, the new mix, uh, when you're crazy, corn was about seven bucks a bushel. Why would you? Why would you possibly plant it in the grass? I said, well, if I plant a corn, it'd make too much money. So, so now it's a little different story. Uh, corn prices are way down, and uh, you have no inputs here, there's no fertilizer. Well, the only input you have is uh, the irrigation water. And again, the time to, to manage it to move the livestock, but that's quite enjoyable. We move them once a day, generally on the pivot. And, uh, then plus you, you get behind, you don't have enough, you got too much grass, you can always hay it. We set up those fences. It's a, in the arc, so you can hay those. When, a, when we first put this in, we had a, in a wagon wheel, we did half of it, and a wagon wheel, I think we had eight or ten paddocks out of that one. It's long and narrow, and uh, one evening the pivot made its revolution. The only good soil we have is around the pivot point. And here there's pure sand, there's a big hill here, and there's clay pan, so that it's some very tough soil. So anyway, the pivot stopped there and didn't shut off. So you imagine water here all night. So it's just a mucked up man. And yes. So then I just ripped those fences out and made it a couple of years and then put in this system. So we added this was the original water point, so we added two more water points there and two more here. There's four paddocks off of each water point. And uh, again, one to two days in each paddock. By the time you get through them, it's time to start over again. So, so it uh, does uh, really change the production. How many head do you put each paddock? Well, this year we had 155 head in, uh, in the seven acres, and we split that in half. So they're in three acres. And uh, so we even tried doing that. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the weekends when I had more time, I would split those into about an hour moves, just get a little bit at a time, just to experiment to see what, uh, see the changes. But again, we were, you put that high stock density in there, basically you just click it, they trample quite a bit, but again, it's, you're feeding the soil, the soil light, so that's, that's the key to the, to the to grazing that way. And again, if you get behind, we didn't have enough livestock, you can always hay it and uh, get the regrowth and you can graze it again. We generally don't like to hay a paddock for several years. You probably hay it once or twice and you can graze it so you can switch back and forth. So, 
and I'm trying to get away from paying the new take in. Anytime you take, you take carbon off the land, and then we do need some hay for the winter. So we are still, still do it do we need hay. This is how the pivot runs. Uh, there's a undercarriage cross over the wires. So that by the wherever it crosses, we put two wires. We tie them together. They're both hot. So the tire comes there in some places with these different types of soil that get quite deep with the ruts. So we'll grab the bottom wire and pull the top one and it walks right over it. It's not a it's not a perfect system. We don't have it parallel so the pivot is running over all the fence at one time. So it's a kind of a different kind of a little bit of an angle. And uh, once in a while it will catch one of the tires and wrap around the axle. That isn't a very good day. Because we're about there and it just keeps rolling and keeps pulling and pulls all the fence around. So it's and it's uh like I say it's not a very good day, but yeah. So you always always check these to make sure they're tied together and they'll run and they'll walk over. And another thing, if you stop the pivot on the fence and you reverse it, that's usually asking for trouble too and catch on the area. So it's uh, it's not a perfect system, but uh, it definitely does work. And then in the fall, we like to leave a lot of grass, and so there's some old grass there for the next spring. So when uh, you get a very rush in the spring, so you get old grass with that, and the melons to dry it that way. Just another shot of the sort of what the grass left in the season. And then I'll go into the other pivot where we. Uh, We've got two pivots where we grow forage for the livestock. And uh, in the past, we would generally hay it uh, five years, four to five years, it depends on you got winter kill. And then you would, and it usually was solid alfalfa, and then you would take it out, probably plant corn uh, one or two years, and then put it right back in the alfalfa. So now we're uh, changing that. Uh, I'll plant a cover crop, a mix. Again, to get as much diversity as possible and to, to feed that soil biology. So we'll do that probably two years when we take the hay out. Uh, usually in June, take the first cutting, spray that uh, hay it, and then plant a cover. And then, uh, then graze that. So this is what we did uh, last year. Uh, it's hard to read on the bottom there, but uh, the next there was about 12 different things in there. It was anywhere it was soybeans, cowpea, Crimson clover, Brazil clover, sweet clover, and Missouri Dutch, Sudan grass, pro millet, pro so millet, buckwheat, turnip, radish, kale, sunflower, cotton rye grass, and field pea. Again, as much diversity as possible uh, to feed that soil. You've got deep roots, you've got shallow roots, you've got fibrous roots, you've got legumes fixing in so you can build the nutrients, break up your tillage layers, and uh, create a, a lot health, healthier environment. That's what it looked like in early October. You can see the, the field peas are possible. That stuff is six, seven feet tall. So then we, that year we thought, oh, why don't we just, uh, this was in October, early October, we were going to just swath it and leave it and uh, swath graze it. And that stuff was so tall and slippery, it didn't work very well. So my son in law, Jesse, was out in the running the hay machine. He said, this isn't working very well. I said, let's try something different. Again, this is a half circle pivot. So the outside track, we cut a swath there and uh, measured that, divided that into 20. And uh, so I would uh, stand out there on top of the floor with a flag on a stick, and he would start at the pivot point and cut a path out towards me. And then uh, he'd go over to the next flag, you could see the pivot point, he would just go back. So these are about two and a half acre strips. And, uh, we would, uh, I said, it probably took us a couple hours to do that. But again, you have these openings when uh, I'll show the like, fence. So this here's when we're grazing in late October. And again, it's very high nutrition. It's uh, the sedan grass and the millet. Of course, they froze, but you've got all the other brassicas and the leaves and the green. So it's, uh, it's a balanced diet where uh, so you don't have to supplement and get more roughage out there. Just another shot of the, how tall that was and then how we set it up with the pivot. Just another shot of the cattle. Again, very 
very high stock densities out there. I think we had 105 pair out there last year in uh, economic uh, show that. But again, it's showing the, you can see the lanes. The object of putting those, those openings, when the pivot crossed those, you know, stuff was real tall, and you just would pick that wire up, and then the, the opening would drop back down, and the cattle also could see the, see the electric fence, and uh, so it worked out quite well. And this is how I set it up. On the, these pivots, they've got a, you know, on the pipe here, there's a hole there, so I, I got these plastic pipes, uh, uh, the poly pipe, uh, about an inch and a half in diameter. Just put a staple at the end, put on high tensile wire, and then between, uh, between each tower, I hung the PE, PE pipe down with an insulator and just attached my wire there, so this is very flexible. So move over the top of the crop and it gets that opening and drops back down. So that worked out quite well. It usually takes two people though when you want to move the cattle. So you start moving that pivot and that end is open there at a temporary fence. So if I go to the pivot point and start it, as soon as that thing starts moving, the cattle would follow the pivot and be around it. So, so then I usually have Mommy come and help. She would start it and not move it to the other end. So we moved it that distance and that's set up my temporary fence on the outside. And this again showing another shot of the, where, where the two pipe hangs down. And again, what I want to show there is what we need. We want to trample, probably take uh, 40, 50, 60 percent of the biomass there, but trample the rest. That's feeding the, the livestock under the land, which is uh, very important when you build your soil, soil health. And, uh, Get everything more in balance. Again, just showing, again, you got all the dung and urine out there. Uh, again, building armor so it's ready for uh, the next year's planting. Again, it's another shot. When I would seed into a cover crop or any field, I don't want to be able to see the soil. I want to totally cover it. That's so important. This is economics. Uh, again, first, we, we, in 2017, we planted. Uh, Actually, I rented it out, the neighbor planted wheat in there, and about the 1st of July or so, we, we hated it, and then we got about two and a half ton of acre of hay, and then we uh, planted the cover crop. And uh, uh, the cover crop, the expense, the expense, uh, the seed was about 40 bucks an acre. Uh, I seeded it myself, I rented it real from the district for 10 bucks an acre. Paid about three dollars for fuel. I did do a burn down uh, about ten months in for Roundup. And I figured the electricity for the pivot for the whole season was about twenty-six dollars per acre. Uh, the repair was about ten bucks. So I had about ninety-nine bucks an acre growing the cover crop. But this is what I got out of it. I grazed it for twenty-six days, then with a hundred five pair of twenty-seven thirty grazing days. I got my 56 acres, that's 48 grazing leads per acre. I figured uh, the high quality was casually easily being two and a half pounds a day. So that's 122 pounds of wheat per acre. Uh, four weight steers, or cat steers and everything together, easily would have brought a seventy, so that's 207 bucks income. So it's about $100 an acre that we uh, return on that. Again, that was growing the cover crop after, after the wheat crop. So I never, never put in the economics of the of the hay the wheat. <clears throat> then in 2018, I uh, well planted a full season cover crop, but early season. So we planted uh, a diverse mix on May 3rd. It was uh, a mixture of oats, peas, vetch, Italian ryegrass, turnips, kale, racine clover, grape, German millet. Uh, again, uh, tremendous diversity. We ate that on July 5th at about 2.2 tons an acre. So now I don't have to plant another cover crop. I'll just let this regrow. So when you hay it, set your shoes as high as you can so you leave quite a bit of the, the biomass there. And uh, you get the regrowth. Of course, this year the, the vetch didn't come very well. The peas didn't come back. Quite a bit of the oats did. The Italian grass really comes on later. Uh, the clay, kale and clovers, so you saw a little bit of that, and the German millet, that showed up quite well. And then of course Mother Nature planted its cover crop to the plant a lot of weeds, so there was uh, a lot of kosher, lambs, corn, but all things that cattle 
do quite well with very high nutrition. So, so we just we graze that, strip graze it from August 25th to September 12th with 155 pair. And then we basically did the same way, we just give them so much each day or every other day. So then in September, as soon as we took the cattle off, September 14th, we seeded it to a mix of winter trigger kale, winter rye, hairy bench, uh, collards, kale, and uh, buckwheat. And then we'll just leave that over the winter. And uh, it grew, it came up with just, you can see it growing quite nice. So the next spring, we'll either uh, get options, we can either hay it, we can graze it, or I guess we could actually take it and you can harvest the two together. And uh, my plan is to seed that back to alfalfa and grass after we graze it, after we graze it, or hay it, or whatever we do. So I'll make up in mind then. But again, uh, by, uh, that's how we take our alfalfa rotation out now. Again, it covers a few years, but again, we're always, when you're hating it, the irrigated ground will take off probably three to four cuttings, and so we will uh, get taking. So we want to build it back before we send it back to a diverse mixture of grasses, the grass and alfalfa. Yeah, that's what it looked like in September when we were grazing. Uh, again, we had 155 pair on there. Then shot, I don't know if this will show up or not. That's the video that is showing how the cow moved. This is going to show it that way. But again, very high stock density. You can see the, the cover crop mix here. You have a cow on the fence, which is a big deal. Again, uh, cows get very easy. Uh, Again, that doesn't show the, 
the, the A we the, our time we got uh, yeah, about two two point three ton A we got off of that first. Again, this is just one one seed in the year before the first we planted we really planted cover so so the return wasn't quite as much but still it was about about eighty to ninety dollars a day. So it's uh, it's a pretty good return for uh, just for like raising livestock. And again I I say it's uh, Soil health, we start building the soil. To me, that's priceless. Again, it took us probably 50, 60 years with our farming methods. I guess we didn't know any better. Now, now we know we really better. That we have, we now we got to try to regenerate our land. And uh, again, we use the covers, the diversity, and grazing management. We can heal the land very quickly. And uh, what we're going to have. Have to do this on a large scale to, to save, 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 uh, save the world, I guess. And uh, so, with that, uh, that's about all I've got today. Uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'll sure try and answer them. <laughs> Just a couple of questions for sure. uh, The nitrates on, that, on your, uh, when you put the cows in in the wintertime for grazing. Was it because you uh, high stock density that you weren't worried about the nitrates? Yeah, again, that question you have to, so we're worried about nitrates. Uh, once you start adding all that diversity, and again, we use very little synthetic fertilizer, so uh, that's never been an issue. Uh, again, they don't just eat one thing. It's a uh, few different, or even like a grazer alfalfa, it can be very lush. You think you have a little problem, but it's, again, the diversity out there, and, uh, it's not, not an issue. I, I don't even check for nitrates or anything anymore. Uh, again, on the, on the irrigated ground, of course, you're not stressing it, so you shouldn't have a nitrate issue either. I'll, I'll still watch, uh, like later in the fall, when we, if we've got a frost, I generally don't want to be grazing right after a frost, so I kind of watch that for uh, prussic acid and stuff like that, but uh, it's not, I haven't had any issue there yet. So. So do you have another question? Yeah, and then with the uh, cover crop, now you uh, um, you want to save the world, but so you want to how many years after cover crop, or how many years in cover crop before you can go like to uh, uh, corn crop or wheat crop? Or well, I would say uh, I would like to. I mean, even if you're doing that, say in the so again, we used to cash grind, we used to raise corn, wheat, and stuff too. But then I would generally plant at least uh, in the added into the rotation before the pivot was generally half would be corn and half would be alfalfa and I, I'll leave it in about five years to flip from like that. Again it was it was corn was usually for silage and then hay so you're always taking everything off. And then we switched uh, switched to uh, adding peas in the rotation or wheat in the rotation on the pivot. So that gave me an opportunity to plant a cover crop after the wheat or after the peas. And then you can graze that, so you can build your soils that way, and then uh, then seed it back to uh, again back to your cash crop the following year, or or into the alfalfa more the rotation. But then on, on dry land, we would generally like seed in barley. We would plant a uh, cover crop after barley, say on the first of August, some of that time, and uh, it was amazing the amount of growth you could get even with very little rain. And uh, we'd cut back on the fertility <coughs> next year and still get the same yield as we did for the we conventional. So we kind of experimented that way. So, so again, depends on how degraded the soils are. Uh, again, if, when I wanted to see the back to grass, that's why we did like up to five years on the poor soil to build it. So then you get a very deep root system in the grass and you broke up those tillage layers because again, Back in the days when we seeded back to grass, we never fixed the problem. We still had those foul pan layers, so we had those restrictive layers, so we had a shallow root system. And then, uh, but by doing the covers, all that diversity, you broke up those tillage layers, added uh, a lot more nutrients in the soil, and they were deep. So now we get a very deep root system on the grass as I would plant it. And it was a good example last year when, when it was very dry. We had, uh, <laughs> still got, I think, between about roughly 40, 40 to 43 grazing days on this, so the toughest field that we're off the cut banks there. 
and uh, we're in the field right beside it. Where the neighbor hated that all the time. He got eight bales on 40 acres. So it was, it was night and day, but the same types of soil. So we uh, so can, uh, by adding that diversity, it's going to help with cash grain crops if that's, if that's the practice. Any questions? Almost answering the question. I was curious how your the hard pan or your tougher soil set kind of responded. Did you see the compaction go down and be able to intense grazing? Um, we did on about that pivot where we had that 155 head this year. We were where the wheel went to see that rye. We did have some compaction on the edge of the field. And then so what we did we just turned on the sprinkler, put a half inch on the water and seeded it. But now with these diverse mixes, we will break up some of these compaction issues too. Again, the compaction issue is generally the the, the amount of time the animal grow on the land. And if you've got good cover, it's, it creates like a sponge effect. Like that pivot on the east side where it had the covers, that was actually the only, uh, I think that was only the first, second, let's see, five years when we took it out. I think we did covers once in there. So now it's in trying to change this practice of adding at least two seasons of the diverse mixture of covers to break up some of the compaction issues too. So, and it, it, it depends on uh, how degraded the soils are when you start. You know, again, you start building the organic matter and you create that spongy effect and you're not going to have the compaction issues. Just one more question. Do you have a like a baseline of what your soil was when you started and how you worried about that? Well, in the past, uh, say 20 years ago, we used to soil test uh, pretty much everything. And our organic matter was anywhere from that 1.7 to maybe that 2, roughly in there. And I did some soil tests uh, just to see what the organic matter was. And it's probably 2, 5 to 3. You know, I still got a quite a ways to go, but again, you just the, show the soil, I mean the top soil is probably about three four inches, and you, you, that's all the restricted layer, so it's some, most of it shouldn't have been farmed in the first place, and, uh, so it's some pretty tough, you bring in uh, pretty tough soil, it's you know, very steep, some of the top of the cut banks that are called class six land back, it's a very steep, the hilltops is actually sandstone and all eroded away from wind or water erosion. Your draws at about 45 feet of top so by the fence line. So we had an idea back with technology in the early 80s. We terraced that to stop the erosion. Well, I had to take the terraces out so I could heal the land <laughs> because uh, I couldn't no till over the dirt too steep. So I hired a neighbor with a blade and uh, we just knocked the terraces down enough so we could cross them. But then again, I, I did. Uh, Without that unit, we did like up to five years of covers and then seeded back to a diverse mixture of grasses and legumes. Where in the past, when you see the grasses, it usually was crested brome and uh, falcon. Now we do uh, probably about 10 species, warm and cool season native grasses and introduced grasses. And then uh, we had more legumes, like alfalfa, red clover, and sizer milk batch. Then we'll even add uh, some of the wildflowers in there, like the little red clover. Uh, Sunflower, stuff like, stuff like that, just to add as much diversity as possible. Try to imitate the native range. And uh, again, it's uh, how, how native range get evolved, so we gotta try to imitate that. Any other questions? I hope we did on time. We got quite a bit of extra time. Now the district does have a tie drill that you, know, you can seed all these grasses. But back then, I just used uh, a rent of the neighbor's drill, a, a little 750 or 1560 up down here. You had a, it was a little tough with the real fluffy seed. But again, when we seeded, seeded it back to grass, 
we usually mixed a cover crop mix with it too, so you had denser seed in there. And it, uh, you still had it wasn't wasn't a perfect system, but it would have to stop every so often, stir it up, and so but it, it did it did work. So and I, I learned the first year I did it. Uh, they say you can't plant uh, warm season natives in August because it won't set a perennial rut. It goes by day length. And uh, they were right. So the next year, that was 2006. We seeded this in 2005. And in 2006 was the extreme drought. Okay, now I grass of the pivot was very thin, so I had an inner seed. So I had a cool season grass at the end of that. And uh, then we grazed it the following year. But uh, it took about five to six years, and pretty soon the native grass started showing up. That was big blue stem switchgrass. Uh, so it's, uh, you gotta have patience with Mother Nature. It seems like it takes, especially these native worm seeds, that takes several years, so don't give up on them. I mean, that, uh, you don't think they're there, but it's amazing when you change the management. Again, high stock density, short time, uh, let it rest, and uh, it uh, eventually it comes back. So. How are we doing for time? So we've got five minutes. So we've got five more minutes of questions. <laughs> Ken, with that cormorant underwater this year, did you have to change the dividends? Yeah, I had to take the cubs out. <laughs> did you have to reduce the number of cows? No, no, actually, uh, uh, yeah, when we took the cows out, the water was waist deep, let it go through and cans would swim down and so we, that actually is probably a good thing. Because in the past, we usually ate some of the pivot because we didn't have enough animals on there, so then this year we run, before we run about 85 head, uh, seven acres and split into thirds. So then this year we run with that group, that 95 pair with this other group. So we had 155 pair on the pivot. So Stream a lot higher density, so I, I think that's probably the benefit. And then that way I don't have to hate the rest of my grains. So that uh, I think that's going to be. A, so I learned something too. I think I've got to get higher density from the pivot, and it's going to change that. So then anyway, we we grazed that pivot, and like I said, I showed we went to the covers. Now we went back down to the core land again. So the, the water went down. Took out quite a bit of the fences, or the canary grass likes to grow on top of the fence. It's growing in the water, and that just lays down, so it's, it's uh, kind of fun to tear that apart again. <laughs> but, uh, again, the cows are down there, very lush grass coming. Where the water just went down, of course, there, there's, there's nothing. But uh, it's, it's changed uh, when we, we used to graze that core land, there was one big pasture. And dry year when you needed it the best, when you needed it the most, it was always the best. On a wet year, I said a 10 year period, it probably could flood two to three years, it's underwater, part of it or all of it. But at first it would take, uh, if I say, for example, it was underwater from June, the June it usually comes up until about the end of August and it drops. But it sometimes take two to three years before that would fully recover that you had grass, it's pretty much just swamp weeds and crud growing in here. It's amazing, especially the 2011 when the man-made flood was it was underwater from the first part of May till the end of August. I mean, it was amazing how fast that grass came back in next year. I, I thought it was going to take several years, but and although it's pretty much a single species, it's canary grass. But uh, we're seeing uh, clovers come in there, black native clover, and uh, so it's uh, just changing the management. Even though you had flooding issues, yet uh, it recovered the resilience of it. It just comes back that much quicker. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess uh, thank you all for sticking here all through my presentation. <laughs>